everyone to Benzinga's next edition of the ETF Unlocked ETF Capital Investment Event here at Benzinga in downtown Detroit. Very excited to bring three different ETF issuers that are current Benzinga partners to the table today and talk about their investment strategies and the thought leadership perspectives on the market as a whole. We're going to dive right in, but before we do that, we have an intro video to kick things off, introduce the three speaker names, and get things rolling for us. We're going to roll right <laughs> Outstanding. So as you saw there in the intro, Motley Fool Asset Management, Sprott Asset Management, and Adaptive Investments all going to be joining us here today to talk about a couple of key themes. Obviously, in the news right now, we have a lot of trending topics that are all about the debt ceiling discussion in the U.S. We have the inflationary landscape being affected by that debt ceiling talk. Inflation as a whole across the globe with many different materials and income streams being affected by the way that prices have risen so dramatically since the COVID pandemic, but even in recent months in the landscape as well. Of course, our first First speaker, Motley Fool Asset Management, and Brian Hinman, their CFA, CIO from the company, going to be joining us first to discuss. Just waiting for him to get into the studio here with us and get started. But before we do that, we do, of course, want to thank all of our participants and the companies for coming on here with us and sharing investment strategies about how to position portfolios, especially in times of turbulence like we have right now. With this landscape all up in the air, again, debt ceiling discussions, inflation, trade talks, policies around the world affecting the way that our portfolios are put together every day. It's important to be able to have strategies from multiple different thought leaders to figure out a way to put your portfolio together. So with that being said, Brian Hinman joining us for Motley Fool Asset Management, CIO at the company. Let's bring him on and get started. Brian Hinman, CIO at Motley Fool Asset Management. Thank you so much for joining us. How are you? Hey, it's my pleasure. I'm doing great. Our pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for kicking us off today. Really excited to dive into a discussion about Motley Fool Asset Management itself, but also the environment around you guys and the investing landscape and some of the strategies that you can share with our investing audience. So we'll kick all that off. We're going to get into a really interesting discussion about the markets. But first, give us a little bit of context around Motley Fool Asset Management, who you guys are and what the strategies are that make you what you do. Yeah, absolutely. We uh, Motley Fool Asset Management is a boutique asset management firm. We were founded in 2008. So we've been around the block here uh, and we've got over a billion dollars under management. I think there's a, a few things that make us unique. First, um, we were born out of our parent company, The Motley Fool, uh, the well-known investment publishing company with a 30 year history of, of helping individual investors. Um, second, our investment approach is based on our own unique definition of quality, um, which takes a truly active, independent and long-term orientation. Uh, and then lastly, we are we're employee owned and purpose driven. So we have a strong culture that allows us to do our best work. And uh, I lead our investing team of nine, a group of cognitively diverse, curious, collaborative, passionate investors. And we serve our shareholders via six investing solutions, three active ETFs and three passive ETFs. Wonderful. Now, I want to break into the difference between the active and the passive ETFs very shortly here. But I think what I want to focus on first is, you know, the Motley Fool itself, very well-known brand, very well-known in the markets. Could you maybe shed a little bit of light right on, on the relationship between the asset management, Motley Fool asset management arm, and Motley Fool as a whole? What does that relationship look like? And what, if any, might be some of the benefits of you guys being born out of a parent company like the Motley Fool? Sure. Uh, well, the, the thing that my lawyers want us to say very clearly is that we are very distinct entities with firm lines uh, between the two. Um, and really, I think the, the main important part of the relationship is that uh, we were born out of that parent company for, you know, on the order of 20 years, the only way that our parent company was helping investors was by publishing investment recommendations and encouraging people to do it themselves. I noted that we were founded in 2008. Well, what happened in 2008? The great financial crisis where yep. uh, many individual investors were literally banging down our doors, the, com the parent company's doors saying, uh, I don't have the emotional capacity to do this myself. I don't have the time to do this myself. I don't have the wherewithal to do this myself. Um, please, can you do this for me? Uh, and help us out. And so uh, that is where the genesis of MFAM came from, um, born out of the same ethos of owning great businesses for the long term, letting your winners run, 
um, and owning the world's best companies that reflect a great vision of the future. Um, so that ethos was what helped uh, MFAM be born. Uh, and we since uh, operate as part of uh, the parent company structure uh, separately, but we have you know, some, some big company resources available to us that a small asset management firm um, may not. Excellent. Well, within the lines of what your lawyers wanted to say, I think that was about as good as an answer as we could have possibly gotten. And thank you for shutting the light there. So sure. let's go ahead and dive into some more detail for MFAM, right? You mentioned the distinction between the active funds and the passive funds. Let's start there. What are the strategies for each and how do you guys deploy these in the markets? Sure. So um, the easy, easiest one to explain is the active uh, is the active side of the ledger because it's really pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. Um, we try to cover the investing landscape um, to make it as easy as possible on uh, investors to gain the equity exposures um, that they need to to drive long term investing performance. And so we offer three funds, uh, Motley Fool Global Opportunities ETF, mid cap growth ETF and uh, small cap growth ETF. And so between those three funds, we cover the investing landscape um of global mid cap small cap uh and have a sort of a growth bent um on the passive side um it's sort of passive in air quotes uh, because uh the unique relationship we have with our parent company is we've been able to license some of their uh ip some of the great uh stock recommendation ideas and know-how that have been built up over 30 years to license some indexes to bring that investing, the investing of the parent company, publishing company, uh, to bear for investors. So we have three passive ETFs, which uh, my team is responsible simply for executing the strategy uh, to, um, to track the indexes that we license from that parent company. Those three strategies are the Motley Fool 100 index ETF, the Motley Fool Next index ETF, and the Motley Fool Capital Efficiency 100 index ETF. And so essentially what's going on there is the, uh, the investment recommendations of the publishing company are packaged into a universe that's sliced and diced um, and made available to uh, retail investors and, and, and invest all investors alike uh, across those three strategies. The, the full 100 is uh, large cap, the full next is sort of mid cap, and then the capital efficiency ETF is uh, sort of a smart beta play on that same investing universe. Excellent. So let's go ahead and get into the details here on the active strategy side, which is really interesting. I think one of the slogans, in fact, on your site is we don't buy stocks, we own businesses, right? I love that yeah. phrase. And I want to talk about that a little bit deeper. And this is almost a basic question to the formulation of ETFs in the first place and how they're used in investing. But when you're talking about the ETF, not just from buying a stock perspective, but really owning the underlying holdings in those businesses, tell us a little bit about that strategy specifically to MFAM. Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting in the context of what's going on in the market right now. So over the past few months, um, markets have been really choppy. They haven't really done much. Now, now the index, the S&P 500 is up 9% for the year, but those gains were basically made in the first few weeks of the year. Uh, and as the market is trying to sort out wh what is happening in the, in the world and in, in, uh, in the economy, um, we've basically been range bound and choppy. But under the surface, what's really interesting um, is that the returns of the market are being driven by just a few stocks. And so we can see that if we look at the S&P 500 being up 9%, but small caps are down slightly and mid caps are up only 1% to 2%. The equal weighted S&P 500, which removes some of the distortion of the mega caps, is up only 1% for the year. And so we're really seeing market leadership being driven in a narrow by just a few stocks, right? Specifically, only 29% of stocks year to date in the S&P 500 are performing better than the index. So what that means is that just a few stocks are pulling all the weight and more of the other, you know, 400 and, and so uh, companies in the S&P 500. My takeaway from that is that stock selection has really, really, really mattered and will continue to really, really, really matter when we're in a rudderless choppy market. And that is what 
our team tries to do is choose the stocks that are ultimately going to be the winners uh, that can create the ballast of a portfolio and generate long-term returns. Outstanding. So we usually break into this part of the conversation a little bit later on, but I think it's particularly present right now because you talked about a lot of these returns being made in the first few weeks of the year, right? And I want to dive into that because when it comes to your funds specifically, right, we talk to all of our issuers about this on a daily basis, and especially in a lot of the news we do, not just these events, but for an ETF investment events, if you're looking at the way that your funds have been affected by the macro landscape this year, right? So many factors up in the air, as we mentioned in the intro, the debt ceiling discussion with U.S. companies being affected right now, the inflationary landscape as a whole. How have you seen your funds on the active side, especially, but on the passive side as well, affected by this overall landscape of turbulence and never ending news headlines, it seemed like for the first couple of quarters here? Yeah. You know, one of the defining elements of our investing philosophy is a long term orientation. And so whenever we are dealing with the barrage of news flow that's never ending, um, the filter through which me and my team view it is, is this going to matter in the long run? Or what are the long run implications of where we are? And so you brought up two, uh, you know, very powerful um, pieces uh, of the market uh, recently, inflation and, and sort of the debt ceiling debate. I'll take them one by one. Um, with inflation, the data clearly shows it's moderating. Um, and while it may be happening more slowly than some want to see, it is happening. But we're coming off of a period where um, there was very there was very little inflation to speak of. And um, when inflation did come, uh, it came hot and heavy <laughs> and uh, was met with an unprecedented quick raise in interest rates and a secular change in the interest rate environment. And so um, it's important to remember that here we are now, we're sort of on the tail end of that, right? Um, the noise, the, the data is noisy and imperfect, uh, but things are definitely heading in the right direction with inflation. Uh, inflation is definitely not spiraling out of control at this point. And that's important because it takes the worst case scenarios largely off the board for us. Um, and it's possible that the Fed continues to raise rates. You know, services inflation remains high. The job market's strong uh, and they seem very committed to driving down inflation beyond just being under control back to target levels. Um, but it's unlikely, we think, that uh, the inflation and interest rate story is what dramatically impacts markets from here forward. That was a 2021 and 2022 story on the back of the 2020 COVID disruptions. And sure, there's still a little bit of the tail happening, but that as a driver of as a primary driver of markets, we think it's just not uh, it's just not what's going to matter as much going forward. And uh, what's going to fill the place of that? Uh, makes us very happy <laughs> uh, because what it means is uh, that I think business performance uh, and you know how companies are actually performing versus expectations, uh, how companies are able to create value uh, for shareholders and deliver value to their customers is ultimately what is going to matter for markets. Now, that is not uh, that does not mean that the uh, news flow is going to go away. We have a very potentially very serious issue on our hands with the debt ceiling. And again, so let's consider our frame. We're playing the long game. So we should ask whether this is going to matter in the long term. Um, and I, I also need to say that I'm not in the business personally of making political predictions. Uh, <laughs> but our base case is that nothing catastrophic is going to happen. Neither political party wants to be responsible for a debt default uh, and giving the U.S. a black eye on the on the global stage. It seems reasonable, and those might be famous last words, <laughs> but it seems <laughs> reasonable to believe that everyone who is uh, part of the decision making here understands the gravity and untenable impacts of persistently higher borrowing costs for the U.S. government in the long run. That is not. Uh, that is not how our nation wants to um, go down the path of its future. Um, with that said, 
we should definitely expect very loud jawboning and we should very much expect things to go up to uh, sort of the deadlines and, and maybe beyond. So let's take a step back and, uh, and, and realize that in 2011 and 2013, we also had debt ceiling issues with 2011 being the scarier um, of the two. So in 2011, um, from peak to trough, while the debt ceiling issue was sort of at its, its fervor, um, the S&P 500 fell about 20%. And small caps fell about 30%. So it was disruptive and it was volatile in the long, in, in the short run. Um, but if we go back to the beginning of the year and say from 2011 to today, the S&P 500 is up 230%. In 2013, when a similar thing happened, uh, 2013 to today, the S&P 500 is up 190%. So with our base case that the catastrophic scenario is very unlikely. And if a deal is reached, uh, the long-term impacts would certainly be muted. This should fade into memory like 2011 and 2013. I think this brings out a really interesting um, piece of, of how we operate too um, and in handling unknowables. Um, we don't try to make discrete singular predictions and then change our entire portfolios to suit that outcome. That to me seems like a really, really challenging thing to be able to do because you have to do it over and over and over and over and over again. And so for us, our focus remains on um, finding and owning the highest quality businesses that represent compelling opportunities that can stand the test of time, whether these tough times, um, enough to survive and thrive in the long term. Uh, and so that's where our focus remains, um, even though uh, this is uh, certainly potentially very scary and something that investors should be paying attention to. Ryan, very, very clean assessment of the situation. I think very thorough too, covering all sides of it there. Your TMFS, the small gra or small cap growth ETF, as of April 30th, 11.39% performance on the year. As we move into the second half of 2023, what headlines do you want to see? What progress do you want to see being made? What would you like to see the driving factors in the U.S. economy, but worldwide as well, trending to be for you to feel confident about the performance here moving forward and about the underlying holdings in that ETF right now? Yeah, um, well, I'll start by saying we feel very confident in the things that we own. Part of what we do is manage focused portfolios. And so you mentioned TMFS, our small cap growth ETF. Uh, it has 30, 32 holdings. And so we don't have to obsess over uh, what's going on in the economy or what's going on in the world. We have to obsess over uh, the fundamental performance of 30 businesses and whether or not they are on track and progressing as uh, we anticipate they would and then making sure that we've constructed a collection of those securities that um, aren't overweighting us to crazy outcomes uh, or risks that we see in the market. Uh, but you asked a question about what am I looking for for the rest of the year to sort of declare all clear? Well, I think you highlighted the debt ceiling as something that is um, very important and on investors' minds. All I care about there is that the worst case is avoided. Whether or not uh, one, one party uh, feels like it is um, giving too much or, or getting too little, um, that I think is not that important uh, if, if we take a, a several year view. Uh, but what is important is avoiding the worst case outcomes. And so I will be watching just to make sure that there is uh, somewhat rational behavior <laughs> uh, happening uh, in the conversations as we're able to uh, assess them. And then, um, and then further progress on uh, the moderation of inflation. I'm less concerned with um, inflation getting that back down to 2% target. What I'm concerned about is that it is relatively stable so that the businesses that we own feel confident in um, making the investments in people and in product and in all of the, uh, the supporting areas that they need to drive value. Outstanding. Brian, a final question for you as we close here, right? I think this is going to play into 
more the overall strategy of you know MFAM as you guys are moving forward, and particularly a call here to investors that may be evaluating MFAM ETFs, looking at your strategies and evaluating that for their portfolio positioning. I'm looking at one of your recent insight pieces specifically about mid-cap stocks during turbulent times. And one of the themes that you called out in the takeaways is mid-caps potentially offering a favorable balance of risk and return, but also outperforming large caps in most rising rate and recessionary environments. Is there anything that you would call out to investors to kind of pay attention to about that as we close and as you look forward to more investments and more decisions throughout the year? Yeah, sure. So the uh, the appeal of mid caps, um, statistically, historically, uh, they don't go down as much as small caps uh, when there are big disruptions uh, in the economy or in the market. So you are in a starting place of slightly more established, slightly better balance sheets, slightly more safety relative to small caps. But then you get sort of uh, a good deal of uh, the bounce back, the snap back that is so characteristic of small caps um, on the upside. And so in a sense, it can be the best of both worlds. The sort of kicker in there for me is that um, small caps right now are, um, are historically cheap. And so it might logically make the argument, hey, go buy small caps or something, something like that, because they're historically cheap. But whenever I'm looking at market averages, they're, they distort what's actually happening in, uh, you know, underneath the surface. The reason that mid caps are sort of the, uh, the interesting piece of the puzzle here is that um, what you find in mid caps is there are a lot of great management teams who have demonstrated uh, prowess in uh, buying smaller businesses, especially when times are tough. And so with all of the uncertainty and not feeling, you know, feeling like I want to go out on a limb and say, now is the time for small caps, I can outsource some of that to my mid cap managers, my mid cap uh, executive teams of the businesses we own, who have a demonstrated prowess of buying up smartly for good prices, smaller businesses to bolster their own businesses to come out stronger on the other side. And so we can sort of tag team our efforts there uh, by owning mid caps. Excellent, Brian. We cannot thank you enough for the time that you and MFAM took to come and join us today on the ETF investment event here at the end of May. Really a pleasure to have you guys on, especially the insights you were able to bring to the table too, just kind of clarifying what's going on in the environment and how Motley Fool Asset Management is approaching it. Brian Hinman, CIO of MFAM, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, my pleasure. Great to have Brian and the Motley Fool Asset Management team on with us today. Producer Aaron Bree is actually going to be joining us shortly on a little bit into the show to tag team the last couple of talks that we have. But before we do that, we do have our next speaker in the studio and waiting to join us. Sprott Asset Management and Steve Schofstall will be joining. We're going to bring him on next. Steve Schofstall, Director of ETF Product Management at Sprott Asset Management. Great to have you here. How are you? Doing well. Thanks for having me, Michael. Pleasure to have you and Sprott here. We've been working on some really exciting stuff with Sprott and the team here in the last couple of months. Really excited to learn more about your approach and everything you guys are doing. So let's go ahead and dive into it here. Give us a little bit of an overview to Sprott, founded in 1981 by Eric Sprott, early adopter of precious minerals and some of the approaches that he put in place you guys are still using today. So let's learn more about you guys. Give us an overview of Sprott and what you guys do. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so we've been around for a while. We've been in the uh, precious metals and, and mining uh, side of the business and, and have several decades of experience there. Uh, currently, we manage about $25 billion in assets. I think what most people probably know us for is our physical bullion uh, closed end funds. Uh, so we have four funds there which give uh, uh, physical exposure to gold, silver, gold and silver, or uh, a platinum and, and palladium basket. Most recently on the Close end front. We uh, about two years ago uh, offered a physical uranium close end fund, uh, which provides uh, it's actually the largest uh, physical uranium fund in the world, about three point three billion dollars, provides exposure to physical uranium. And most recently, we've re really been moving into uh, the ETF space, particularly in the United States. Uh, we have offer nine different ETFs. Uh, we have a gold miners ETF, a junior gold miners ETF 
And we've recently rolled out a, uh, a suite of six uh, energy transition ETFs. So those are pure play uh, ETFs that focus on providing exposure to uranium miners, junior uranium miners, lithium miners, uh, nickel miners, uh, junior copper miners. And then finally, we have a broader base strategy uh, in the energy transition suite, which uh, provides pure play exposure to miners of nine different critical minerals that are powering the energy transition. And our last ETF uh, that, that really follows along with what our pedigree is, is the uh, Sprott uh, ESG Gold ETF, which provides physical exposure to uh, 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 gold bullion, but it does it in a way in which we actually know the prominence of, of the gold in the fund. So it has the most stringent uh, screen related to responsibility and, and how gold's being sourced. Excellent. Excellent. Great start, Steve. So now that we have a feel for Sprott and what you guys are all about, we want to dive into the ETF specifically, because I'd venture to say, too, especially for right now, what we see in the ETF business here at Benzinga and what our analysts are bringing to us on a daily basis is AI and precious critical minerals may be two of the biggest topics in the market, let alone the ETF industry right now. We see a ton of interest in AI generated, uh, some of these newer ETFs that are being issued and especially the critical minerals ETFs as well, uranium and um, and some of the some of the ETFs that you guys have focused in precious minerals, getting a lot of traction and getting a lot of interest as well. So if you could maybe give us a brief overview of the precious minerals market as a whole from where you guys are sitting at Sprott, where do you see the most demand? Where do you see some parts of, of industries and sectors that have a lot of demand for these precious minerals? And what's your take on the overall supply and demand side of things as well? Sure. So it's it's a uh, a part of the market that has been really underappreciated, I think, in, in recent years, and it's just now starting to get its due. Um, if you look at some of the latest research out just last year alone uh, in the critical mineral space, we've seen about one point one trillion dollars invested uh, on a global scale uh, to the energy transition. And that's a significant number for a couple of reasons. One, it, it's, it's a, a new record as far as investment across the uh, the globe. But then secondly, it's also the first year in which the energy transition investments have actually been on par with what we're seeing from fossil fuels. Um, a lot is talked about when it comes to the energy transition of reaching net zero uh, carbon emissions by 2050. And, and that's a, a goal that I think pretty much every nation, uh, 193, I think at last count, have signed on to, uh, minus a few nations out there. Um, so that's the goal that the globe tends, uh, global community tends to be working toward. Uh, in order to get us there, though, um, $1.1 trillion is, is, you know, a lot of money and, and um, there's a significant amount of investment that needs to happen uh, to, to reach those goals. And so to give you an idea on the magnitude of what we're seeing there, uh, just throughout the rest of this decade, if we're supposed to stay on track to those uh, 2050 goals, uh, we would need to see almost four times the investment that we saw last year. Uh, so it's a, a tall order, I think, particularly as we enter into this uh, season where it looks like the uh, recession in the United States and potentially on a global scale may be impending. And and we'll see how that affects uh, investments into the space of, over the short term. Uh, but once you look longer term, this is a, uh, a sector that we think is something that's going to be around for uh, many years or, or, or several decades. It's going to take that long for this to play out. Uh, that 1.1 trillion uh, that, that I mentioned actually grows to about seven trillion dollars come 2030, and needs to have uh, a significant average throughout the next decade as well if we're going to meet those targets. And, and typically, what we what we've seen, uh, you know, in the United States is, is we tend to lag a little bit in this uh, case, and some of it might be uh, either from a political perspective or a geographic perspective, we're a little bit more. Uh, dispersed uh, from population centers uh, that you might see in Europe, uh, where they've tend to fully embrace uh, the energy transition, whether it comes from uh, the hydro or solar or wind farms. Uh, France always stands out as uh, someone who's really embraced uh, nuclear power, uh, where they get about 75% of their uh, electricity comes from nuclear power. And, and uh, uranium obviously has a, a big uh, part to play in that. Uh, but we're starting to see uh, that come back home here as well as the globe and particularly Western nations are looking to deglobalize supply chains as it relates to these critical minerals. Uh, I think one thing that the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine really highlighted was the need by many Western countries that they have to take control of their supply chains. Uh, I think we all remember the stories from about a year ago about uh, the natural gas uh, pipelines potentially cutting off uh, supplies to, to much of Europe and uh, countries like Germany that 
uh, tend to rely heavily on coal and natural gas. We're, we're very much susceptible to that. And in uh, countries like France, to a certain extent, uh, might might not have, uh, you know, they might have a little bit more security over their their uh, uh, electricity output. But with this deglobalization effort, what we're really seeing is the United States, Canada, Canada, the EU, Australia, and some other uh, friendly nations uh, starting to band together to move production back uh, out of of countries that might either have mining practices that aren't up to the standards that that we're typically accustomed to, say in Australia or Canada, or that um, you know might have a, a large part of, a part of the uh, supply chain, whether it's on the refining side for critical minerals. Uh, so we're starting to see investments in the United States. If you look at the uh, infrastructure bill and the Inflation Reduction Act, we're seeing you know hundreds of billions of dollars uh, either through subsidies or direct investments in in our grid or uh, investing in the companies to to start to bring our critical minerals uh, mining to life here. And not only that, we're starting to see end users, uh, so particularly automakers, uh, start to invest vertically in the supply chain. Uh, the headlines out of uh, Texas a couple of weeks ago about Tesla building a new gigafactory, which is basically, or uh, I'm sorry, a new refinery uh, to refine the lithium uh, that it plans to use in its EVs would expect to, to allow enough lithium for about 1 million cars to be produced annually, which is uh, a significant amount, uh, given that it is uh, more than what North America is producing uh, at this time. But we do see some significant growth uh, uh, looking to carry us into the next decade and beyond. Outstanding. Now, Steve, there's a couple of things that you said in there that I want to key in on. One of them was, I think you mentioned this uh, this stat as well, but when it comes to the investment, uh, specifically talking about the SETM ETF here, investment for the foreseeable future to meet some of these net zero targets, potentially needing to accelerate to $3.9 trillion from 2023 to 2030, just in order to meet these targets. If we see this kind of substantial investment increase, right, what does this mean for the holdings and the companies that are a part of this ETF, the companies that are affected by your investment strategies and the companies that you guys are investing in? What does this mean for them in terms of production capacity, uh, new business lines? And what actually happens to the industry if we do see the substantial investment we need to hit these targets? Yeah, I think that's a that's a great question. And I, I think I'll highlight that first by talking about the uh, strategy that we developed. So for for all of our energy transition ETFs, we're focusing on pure play companies. And, and what we define as pure play is a company that's deriving at least 50 percent of its assets or has 50 percent or more of its um, operations tied to whichever critical mineral we're targeting. So whether it be uranium or, or copper or lithium. Um, so that's something that we've put in place. Uh, to really ensure that we're providing those pure play upstream companies that are at the, the very top of the supply chain, uh, those companies that are responsible for bringing these critical minerals to market. Uh, we did uh, recently launch uh, five ETFs that are, are based on uh, 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 NASDAQ Sprout indexes, which we co-developed with uh, NASDAQ in a great partnership there, in which we actually start with a universe of about 90,000 different equities. And from there, we, we pair the uh, the list down basically uh, filtering down anybody that doesn't have any firm that doesn't have those pure play uh, characteristics. And, and we end up in the uh, broader energy transition ETF, which is uh, ticker SETM, uh, with a little over 100 securities in there. And when it comes to the investment that uh, governments and, and, and end users of the, uh, uh, the minerals that these miners are producing, uh, we would expect to see um, a couple things happen uh, as it relates to the holding. So first would be, you know, as investments coming in, we would expect them to be able to expand operations, increase, uh, increase revenues and, and, and grow organically. And then secondarily, once you start to increase this, uh, this profit incentive, uh, we would expect to see, particularly amongst the, the more junior miners in some of these funds, uh, some mergers and acquisitions to take place. So by way of example, if you look at the lithium miners ETF, ticker LITP, uh, which is the only ETF that provides pure play exposure uh, to lithium miners. Uh, another interesting characteristic about our, our lithium product, as, as well as the other uh, energy transition funds uh, that we develop with NASDAQ, is that we do not have any China A shares. So those are those mainland Chinese uh, securities are not included uh, in the index. So to the extent that we're moving um, supply chains outside of China and bringing them to Australia or to the United States, uh, we would expect these companies that, that don't have a significant footprint there uh, in China to benefit potentially. 
Um, and then we have seen actually an increase in some M&A activity on the lithium space in particular. Uh, Albemarle, who is the largest um, miner of lithium in the world, uh, has tried three times now to uh, acquire Liontown Resources, which is a, uh, a, a pre-development uh, Australian miner. Uh, and then most recently, uh, we have Alchem, who is going to merge with Livevent, which is expected to close uh, later this year, which would make the, that new combined company the third largest uh, lithium producer in the world. Wonderful. So we covered a lot of ground there really quickly. Uh, another thing that you know, I think you hit on when you went through the last section of discussion around the ETFs themselves is something else I want to cover. Part of our team will actually be in New York, I know, potentially meeting with your team as well um, for the ETP forum that's taking place in New York City, discussing some of the biggest themes in ETF and uh, investing and what's going on in the industry, what we expect to change, et cetera. One of the topics that will be on the agenda is the continuing evolution of ESG investing. And of course, all of this ties into precious minerals investing, um, some of the, the renewable energy investments that, as you mentioned, we're starting to see some traction and maybe just now getting their due. What things, you know, when it comes to especially the debt ceiling discussion in the U.S., the inflationary landscape, do some of those factors make it more difficult for these renewable energy investments and, you know, ESG investing in ETFs? Does it make it more difficult for money to flow there when everything else in the economy is getting so constricted with rising prices, the debt ceiling? What's the relationship there, if any, between the difficulty of getting these, these ETFs to get their due? I think the probably the most notable, particularly as it relates to smaller companies that are are reply, um, uh, have to rely on the uh, capital markets, is when those interest rates do increase and inflation increases, and, and you see uh, banks not as willing to extend credit. Um, you know, the, the capital expenditure for some of these smaller companies might uh, be higher than we would like. Um, but what happens then in that that situation? It also does allow uh, a couple of things to happen. So. When you do have uh, these smaller companies that have uh, found proven reserves, uh, it does potentially uh, make them a uh, uh, either uh, an M and A target or else, uh, you know, uh, allows them to join with a, a much larger uh, uh, mining company so that they can develop those resources. And then I think one thing that's really kind of helping sustain the, uh, the the miners in this case is when you look at Ford, you look at GM, you look at you know Volkswagen and and Tesla, they are moving up the supply chain. And basically what they're saying is uh, we have a huge need uh, for, you know, whether it be lithium or nickel or cobalt for our EV batteries. Uh, and we realize that we're at a uh, supply deficit and that's likely to persist uh, for the better part of the next decade or so. Um, and so what they're doing then is investing in these individual mines. Uh, the Thacker Pass in Nevada, which is a mine that's currently under construction, uh, immediately comes to mind. Uh, that's a joint venture with GM and Lithium Americas, in which GM is investing $650 million into that mine, which is going to be developed over two stages. Uh, and, and for doing that, they uh, enter into an agreement where they basically get uh, you know, a, a percentage of the lithium that is coming out of that mine at a predetermined price. Uh, so I believe in that case, I believe GM gets you know, 100% of the lithium coming out of the uh, the first round of mining and then the second round of mining, uh, they, they have 50 percent. And I believe they get uh, have the option to take up to 100 percent of the lithium coming out of there. Um, so while we do have uh, lower prices in many of these commodities um, because they are just now becoming uh, a forefront in the energy transition, investment is just now starting to flow in there. I think you're going to see these end users uh, in particular uh, really step up and make sure that uh, you know, to protect their own business model, to make sure that uh, th they're able to secure the resources that they need. And they're, they're really starting to put their money uh, to work. Excellent. Well, again, Steve, we really appreciate all the insights you've been able to give us. And honestly, I'm, I'm grateful that we have the opportunity to be producing a lot of content with you guys right now, too, because I think there's a lot more to this conversation that we don't even have time to cover here. So excited to see some more insights coming out from Sprott to our audience on other channels soon. But as we wrap here, let's maybe take a final look into the future of the ETFs that you guys have right now. Again, speaking directly to our retail investor audience, people that may be considering these types of investments to build their portfolios. If you look at the rest of the year, what headlines should they be paying attention to? What progress or what developments should investors be expecting to see if we if we want to see the long-term growth of this industry and the health of it and the growth overall keep coming? What should we be looking for? What should we be wanting to see as investors? Uh, I, I think as we go into the, the short and medium term, uh, one of the things that I think really sticks out to us is 
when you go to open up a new mine to bring these minerals to market, it can take, you know, 10 years to 15 years from once you discover a resource till you can actually uh, begin to uh, get that mine to produce. Uh, one of the things that we're, we'd really be looking for, and it appears that we're moving in the direction where uh, many of the governments are going to try to expedite this process. Uh, so where maybe we can get from, you know, a 15 year time frame to a much shorter time frame. Uh, other, otherwise, we could potentially have a, uh, a situation where, you know, we're not able to ramp up supply as quickly as we would like. And, and um, in that case, you would expect to see a uh, underlying spike in the uh, underlying commodity. And, and I think just one thing to note um, as it relates to um, uh, the securities that, that we track in our benchmarks uh, is that uh, the miners over longer periods of time generally do perform very well uh, when the underlying commodity does. So uh, what I mean by that is over the short periods of time, if you look at lithium carbonate, for example, which is key for batteries and, and EVs, uh, we've seen about an 80% increase since it, it hit a 20 month low at the end of April. Um, we wouldn't expect to see a corresponding move uh, in the underlying lithium miners uh, over that time period. But over the longer term, we would expect uh, these companies to be well positioned to uh, take advantage of any increased pricing that we're seeing. And for us, this is really a long term investment proposition. Uh, you know, those uh, investors that we talk to that are interested in the theme are generally bought into the energy transition notion, whether they agree with the merits or not. Uh, they're able to see that the uh, uh, world governments are actually putting a lot of money to work. Companies are putting money to work. Uh, you know, uh, automakers like Ford and GM are, in many cases, saying by 2035 will no longer produce internal combustion engines. So the world's moving this way, and it's it, it's a longer term trend, and we think it'll take some time to play out. Uh, but we're at the very early stages of what, what we think could potentially be a generational shift uh, in the way that we produce and consume energy. Amazing. Steve, once again, an absolute pleasure having you and Sprott as Asset Management on with us for this edition of the ETF Investment Event. Great insights. Excited to have you guys back again soon to talk more about the precious mineral space, everything that you guys are doing with your investment strategies. Steve Schofstall, the Director of ETF Product Management at Sprott, thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Looking forward to it. Steve Schofstall there joining us from Sprott Asset Management and joining us also in the studio for our last conversation Producer Aaron Bree jumping in to take us away on the last conversation with adaptive investments for the day. I'm just going to change his camera angle so we can see his face because, again, what is a show without Aaron Bree on screen? And there he is. Aaron, thanks for joining us. What is up, Michael Murray? How are you doing today? We are good. Two out of three conversations down. Our last conversation with adaptive investments scheduled to be one of the more interesting ones of the day. Very excited to talk with Scott Weatherington, the CIO over at Adaptive. So let's go ahead and bring them on and get started. Scott Weatherington, CIO at Adaptive Investments. Thank you for joining us. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. Good morning. Or good afternoon. to have you guys here. Very excited to have been talking with the Adaptive team over the last few weeks here, getting some insights into how you guys are looking at the markets and your approaches to what you do. Kick us off there before I let Aaron Bree take you away with a couple of questions about some specific things you guys are involved in. Give us an overview of Adaptive and tell us what the company is all about. Sure. So we manage uh, four ETFs, exchange traded funds. Uh, one is a unconstrained go anywhere fund. It's called our Alpha Opportunities Fund, uh, five star morning star fund. Um, really nice, really nice track record. Uh, that ticker is AGOX. And we can get into a little bit more details about that shortly. Um, we've managed two tactical funds um, that we kind of benchmarked the tactical category. One's tactical rotation, one is tactical outlook. And then we manage a multi-asset income strategy. We utilize mostly um, call writing in that strategy, but we also kind of have a little bit of um, unique underlying strategy there. We use low correlation assets, um, commodities and treasuries to give us sort of a you know, correlation benefits and downside protection against our call writing equity positions. Um, for the most part, all of our strategies have some sort of risk on, risk off component to it. Um, for folks on the call, we have a website that uh, we track that live. Um, it's www.adaptiveriskhedge.com. And investors can go and peruse that website and see how our um, signals go real time. We've been pretty accurate for the most part over the years. Um, very nice during COVID, during the bottom of 2020, we um, had a recovery there in very early April. 
um, and actually was risk off in that late February, so very timely. And then uh, we've been recently risk on, and we can get into that a little bit more in detail in a minute, but since about early December, we've been risk on. And through last year, we were risk off almost the entire year. We were risk on for January last year, and we were risk on for December last year. Uh, we maintain risk on for all of 2023 so far. So just kind of quick background for us. Thank you, Scott, for uh, for running us through that. What um, you know, what what exactly is the difference, I guess, for investors that want to go with uh, AG OX? Like, who who's the target uh, demographic for investors in that fund? So we kind of think of it as like a satellite approach. If you have your core static passive buy and hold story, um, AG OX is a very actively managed fund. And so it's it brings elements of downside protection. It can go anywhere if, if you know if, if the manager there. We actually outsource that strategy to a sub advisor called Bluestone. If the manager there thinks it's um, prudent to be in large cap growth, it can tilt large cap growth. Um, recently, it's been portfolio positioned. We've re we've fully invested all available cash. Um, they've hedged off. They've had some financial exposure. Some of it's been sold off, and some of it's been hedged um, actively through some callers. Um, they have tilted towards large cap U.S. growth recently with individual names as well um, about a month ago, as well as reducing some commodity exposure. Um, so think tactical, think pretty much go anywhere. It's best high conviction trades um, with a sort of outer layer of downside protection. Um, so interesting story. Um, you know, if your core is passive, buy and hold, it's a it's a can be a really nice active component. Yeah. So, so what exactly? I mean, is the I understand that adaptive ETFs has this, uh, you know, kind of, I guess, mission of a of a modern portfolio theory. What what exactly is that? Well, so it's if you think of just the original modern portfolio theory, it's mostly um, an equilibrium global diversified model. Um, so there's there's no there's no sort of relevance to to downside protection. Right, it's just you kind of own everything all the time, stay with it, buy and hold, um, which I think is a fine strategy. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. There's plenty of passive ETFs out there, the vanguards of the world or, or whomever, where you can get all this great global exposure at a really low cost. It's a it's a great strategy. Um, but then again, none of those strategies have any downside protection. Um, so, and it's very important, I think, to have some sort of component of that in your portfolio. You know, years like last year where fixed income doesn't really provide much of a buffer or low correlation. Um, it's tough to kind of get that that diversification anywhere else other than sort of an active or tactical strategy. Got it. Thanks for, for walking us through that. Um, so we talked about AGOX. What are some of the other funds that uh, Adaptive ETFs is, is managing right now? So we have two other tactical strategies. One is tactical outlook, where we have a sector approach. Um, currently, we favor XLK and XLY, which are technology and discretion. And we've had that position on for roughly, um, I would say, four to six weeks now. And we also have a put option on the S&P that we put on. So that, that fund has sort of best idea sector rotation with the ability to hedge that portfolio with put options. Um, and then we run a tactical outlook fund, which is benchmarked. We kind of think of in the back of our mind benchmark to the Russell 3000. So we currently have a position with large mid cap, small cap allocated to the Russell 3000. Then when our signals go off, we peel back a little bit of that hedge and um, can go as, as low as 20% equity exposure at 80% cash. Um, and then lastly, um, a fund that we've had some interesting interest in is our multi hedged asset income fund and so I think call writing um, there's a few there's a few ETFs out there that are in the call writing space so um, you know there's maybe five or six that are pretty decent um, what makes ours a little bit different is we combine different asset categories so we have the Qs we have NASDAQ we have the S&P 500 and um, then we have call writing strategies on as well and then we have treasuries that up to so and we also have gold so think of it as like target strategic allocation of like 30 to 50 percent equity strategic target allocation of about 20 percent gold and then about 20 percent target allocation for treasuries and we have the ability and capabilities to write calls on all three of those sectors or asset categories what kind of what kind of makes that story a little bit unique is we can generate roughly one percent per month of call writing so kind of targeting a 10 to 12 percent 
dividend distribution, but we also have some implied downside protection by having treasuries and um, gold positions in there as well, which tend to do very well if we go into a recessionary environment, um, you know, mar larger market corrections and, and things like that. Uh, most other already strategies out there are simply just long equity or long something else and then just write the calls against it. So there's not much downside protection. They will get um, they will get burned if there's a big correction. Um, another final element to that strategy is we have the ability to, to uh, buy put options on the equities as well. So not only to get the benefit of the extra income, we can use some of that premium to purchase put options if our signals go deep into the red, looks like recession's coming, bear contraction, bear market, and we can hedge that downside protection. So we distribute income, uh, but also have a downside protection, almost like a little bit of a collar. Got it. So, um, I mean, what exactly right now? I mean, for when, when there's time to make a decision, like for the tactical outlook ETF, and it's time to switch from one industry to a next, is it a single person making that decision? Is it a committee? Is it up to algorithms? Or, or how exactly um, does that happen? Uh, it's mostly algorithm and mostly committee. Uh, we do have an investment committee and uh, we meet weekly uh, on a formal basis quarterly, but we do meet, meet weekly. Um, we actually post our algorithm to the to our website daily. Um, and that drives most of our strategy. It, what we don't post is our recessionary indicator, which if that does go first, we actually will make a hedge. Um, it doesn't often go first, it usually typically lags. Um, but in terms of any other model, you could, there's a very simple gauge on there. It shows risk on, risk off, um, has the data. I think we've got, we roll about three years of rolling daily data. Um, so if one gets bored one day, you can go back and, and take a look at some of that data and see where we've been risk on, risk off. Um, but so it's mostly algorithmic. We have a methodology for how much we'll hedge based on some of those signals. The most important one is our technical that kind of drives the other ones. So if the technical triggers first, we have a pretty heavy hedge on. And then if the others follow, we get even heavier. Um, and then also technical tends to lead us out a little bit. So we'll start peeling back risk on if, if we have to uh, get back in the market using that as well. Got it. Yeah, I've always been curious how different, you know, ETF companies manage their actively managed ETFs. What are some of the things that are like top of mind for the investment committee right now? Yeah, it's the normal story. I mean, so inflation expectations, uh, something that we've been watching closely is um, the breadth of the market's been very weak. Um, so if you think about the S&P 500, the equal weight version of it is is actually flat for the year. Um, and most of the S&P return itself has been driven by just a few large cap tech names, obviously, so the usual suspects. And so it's a very unusual dispersion right now where you know it's almost a thousand basis points between the S&P 500 and the equal weight. Um, that won't that that just won't continue. We think that there's going to be broader participation um, as the year goes on, as well as we've had mid cap and small caps um, really lag um, this year. And just the last couple of days, we've started to see mid caps and small caps really start to participate. Even today, I think you're starting to see small caps kind of perk up a little bit, where large cap growth is probably getting a little bit heavy. Um, so our view right now is what's on the top of our mind is. Is the rest of the market, the breadth of this market, is it going to pick up over the rest of the year? And um, if we stay bullish and we stay risk on, we think um, that's where you want to be. So think Russell 3000, have some mid cap exposure, have some all small cap exposure. It might surprise to the upside. OK, so kind of like a reversion to the mean that after a while, the small caps have been lagging uh, the, the big names and the S&P 500. And we're going to start seeing some reversal there. Yeah, it's just hard to believe it can continue. I mean, you know, you start looking at NVIDIA near 350, 155 times earnings. I mean, things start to get a little bit elevated there. Um, I think it's overall not unhealthy for the market. And I think that's it's it's a misnomer to say, well, it's just being led by certain names and that's very unhealthy. I, I disagree. I think it's it's just they've just been, you know, they were just pretty much taken to the woodshed last year. And all that based on rising rates, which have, you know, for the most part, you know, look to be flattening out. And so those asset classes have very, I mean, those particular names have huge free cash flow. They're strong names, well managed, and, and they should be doing well. So it's not healthy whatsoever. We just think there's going to be some broader market participation as we go forward. Yeah, I think that's been one thing that, you know, we've been looking about uh, or looking at a lot as well is just, 
seeing the fact that the market strength has really come from a, a concentrated few names and not this overall market breadth. So if you're invested in the IWM or you know some of these small caps, you might not feel like your portfolio is seeing what uh, or, your, or your portfolio doesn't look like what the overall market's doing right now. Um, what I mean. What would you consider like for for an, an, a retail investor for someone building their own portfolio? Like, what kind of tips would you give them? Yeah, so we tend to we have um, we have some models that we build for advisors that break down risk buckets from aggressive to conservative, as most financial advisors would would probably recommend based on your risk tolerance. Um, so our best advice is to think of things in three different sleeves, and so we have. In those models, we have a strategic allocation, which is your, as I mentioned before, it's your modern portfolio theory, passive, low cost index, get as broad diversification as you possibly can domestically as well as international emerging markets. And that goes for fixed income as well. And so that should have a pretty healthy component of your overall allocation, call it 40% at least of, of that passive allocation. Um, and then we, we usually recommend a tactical component of at least 20%. So we have some of our strategies mixed in there that will give you some downside protection and cushion some volatility to the downside um, so that you're that acts is sort of like the chassis so that you're not trying to engage yourself in market timing on a regular basis or try and time markets daily and weekly and let that work for you do the heavy lifting and act as your chassis for some downside protection um, and then lastly we have an opportunistic sleeve we tend to think of one or two high conviction ideas for the year and um, you know, two years ago it was large cap growth. Last year it was it was large cap value, and we'll usually have one or two high conviction years um, that we'll we'll instill in the portfolio. This year we, we're split for the most part value and growth, um, and so that's that's kind of how I think an investor might want to think about their portfolio. Um, you know, we have we have a website out there, Smart Portfolio Advisor. Those those allocations are out there. We don't charge a fee for them. Um, they're available for any anyone to, to take a look at and utilize to their, their advantage. Wow. Well, there you have it. You've got some free tools that you guys can go check out from uh, Adaptive Investments. Scott, thank you very much for joining us on uh, ETFs Unlocked today on Benzinga's channel. Thank you. Pleasure. Of course. Have a good rest of your day. All righty, folks. Going to bring my man, Michael Murray, back on the stage how you excellent. doing mike good excellent interview ab that was that was exciting to get some of the I, I feel like we had three different kind of perspectives from three different companies there i liked a lot of what adaptive had to say so really exciting i thought, I thought we got a good breadth of the conversation and especially when the interest rates and the fed uh the fed decisions and the debts uh the debt ceiling raising uh topics are so heavily present right now um, i think it's great to get some of these fund managers in with a wide perception of the economy as a whole and some of the different investments you can get with these funds so Really exciting all the way through. Great conversations. Loved it all. And of course, we do want to thank all three companies for participating. Adaptive Investments, Sprott Asset Management, and Motley Fool Asset Management. All three companies with some really interesting topics. Yeah, well, thank you for letting me hop on, Michael. And uh, thank you for everyone tuning in. Please smash the like if you have not already and subscribe to the channel. Um, I'll be back live tomorrow for Benzinga Live. Or actually, no, we're doing our sports betting. ETF yes, sports tomorrow. betting Titan Summit. Very exciting. Woo! <laughs> We're looking, forward, looking forward to that one and looking forward to the next ETF investment event as well, which we should be holding in mid-June, just about a couple of weeks away here. A lot of new companies and a lot of new issuers coming your way. Otherwise, excited for the rest of Benzinga Live for the rest of this week. And of course, like Aaron Bree said, make sure to follow Benzinga Live, hit the like button, and make sure you stay tuned. We'll see you next time.